Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Hope everyone's week is starting off hot. Uh, mine's been pretty good so far myself. My dad was in town. We hit IHOP for Unlimited Pancake Month. Uh, I didn't know that I could have 11 pancakes and a ham and cheese omelet, and it turns out that neither did my toilet. Uh, but again, like I mentioned, it's been a great week so far. So as of course any good week should end up, uh, of course we're going to need some systems design, or I guess in this case distributed systems, so let's go ahead and talk about them. Have you ever wondered exactly how many IHOP pancakes you can fit into your parabolic belly? By any chance, were you also too distracted by pubescent horniness in high school to focus on geometry class? Just me? Whatever, that's where Brilliant comes in. Compared to boring things like books, videos, and other human beings, Brilliant's interactive lessons have kept me focused and allowed me to learn. Since I have three monitors, I can even devote one of them to watching Family Guy Funny Moment compilations and the other to watching Subway Surfers playthroughs. I found that in particular, Brilliant's new LLM course has been a major enabler for me to learn about key topics in modern artificial intelligence. It allows you to get hands-on experience with real language models. Now, instead of responding to my hundreds of Tinder matches all by myself, I can build a bot to give them the ick just like I normally would. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, check out brilliant.org slash jordanhasnolife or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual subscription to Premium. Alrighty, so today we're going to be talking about Google SSO from 2006, and basically this is a workflow that we've probably all used plenty of times because basically whenever an application uses your Google account as a third-party sign-in, uh, that is basically going to allow you to sign in with Google, and uh, this is really what we're going to be hitting. So even as far as 2006, this was already pretty popular and it already had billions of users at scale. So the interesting thing about this paper and the reason that we're ultimately covering it today is one, it's short. And I don't have a lot of time this week, and two, and more importantly, it is basically one of the premier, or rather first papers about how to actually implement strong consistency or single copy semantics, as they call it, in practice at such a large scale. And so the reason they want this kind of one copy semantics is the fact that when it comes to something like changing your password or anything like that, eventual consistency is definitely going to be confusing for a user. You don't want to change your password and then basically go back to sign in and then see, hey, wait a second, uh, your password has not actually been changed. So that's going to be a problem. They've ultimately opted to make life a lot easier and just implement strong consistency. And when I say life a lot easier, well, it's going to be a lot easier for the user and perhaps developers trying to debug things, but for the actual creators and managers of the SSO service, perhaps not. So we'll talk about some of the challenges that they actually encounter when building this thing out. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about is actually doing an overview of high availability in general. So you know, typically when you think about something like the CAP theorem, the idea is that you can only have uh, consistency or strong consistency, availability, and uh, you know, tolerance in the face of network partitions. You basically pick two of three of those. Uh, but basically, uh, the idea here is that they're able to get all three. And the way that they do that is by using distributed consensus. So we've spoken about this plenty on this channel. And the question is, what do we actually do distributed consensus on? Well, distributed consensus allows us to basically make linearizable writes. And the reason this is useful is because we can basically perform that on our replication log. So basically, we have some master node. The writes are going to be propagated via that master. And then we're going to require a quorum of approvals in order to get that write actually successfully replicated to all of our follower nodes. So basically, um, you know, on every write, we need a quorum of approvals. If for some reason our master node goes down, we need a quorum of approvals in an election. So this is something I've spoken about plenty when it comes to our raft videos and uh, just in general, you know, for example, like the digital wallet type of video or uh, the payment gateway, you're going to be using something similar to this as well. And so this is just going to dig into it slightly deeper. So reads are going to be performed on the master node as well, and this is going to require something called master leases, which I really haven't spoken about too much on this channel in the past, so I think it's a nice opportunity to dive into that a little bit. So the problem with this is that any single time that we have one master node, uh, that is obviously going to become a bottleneck at massive scale. And so when it comes to actually scaling out writes, typically we have two options. One is we can allow writes on more master nodes, or we can partition things out and then basically try to linearly scale out our throughput with the number of partitions, or in this case, the number of shards. Partitions and shards, not necessarily the same thing. You can have many partitions on a shard. So 
in Google's case, basically they're gonna use these many database shards. They're going to assign range-based partitions to these shards and they're going to geographically distribute those. So that for example, users in Asia might have an easier time hitting certain shards. Users in America might have an easier time hitting certain shards. It's going to keep latencies down. They do do range-based partitioning, or at least that was my interpretation on my read of the paper. Maybe in reality, uh, this has since changed, but uh, you know, for example, in Dynamo, they're doing something like hash range-based partitioning to in theory avoid hotspots a little bit more. Maybe these guys are just a little bit quickly, uh, quicker to dynamically shard things, but uh, who knows, hard to say. Okay, so we're gonna quickly touch upon Paxos writes because they're effectively the same thing as a raft write. Basically, if this is our client, if this is our master, as we can see, the write first goes to the master. It's then going to attempt to apply that write on all of the replicas. So in this case, it's these two over here because these are known as the electable replicas, meaning that they are the ones that we care about for achieving quorums. So let's say it works on this node over here and it fails on this node over here. That's okay because we've now hit our two out of three quorum. So we've uh, had the right on a majority of nodes. We can go ahead and commit it accordingly. It's kind of like a two phase commit where this is like a prepare phase. And then eventually the master will go back and say commit. And then in addition to these electable replicas, uh, SSO also has this concept of non-electable replicas. So basically these guys are just a bunch of read-only standbys sitting over here. And the reason this can be useful is sometimes, for example, data really isn't going to change very often. And in that case, it's okay to have some slightly stale replicas because the majority of the time you're going to be read reading data that hasn't changed in a while. It might take some load off of your master as far as read go, reads go. Cool. Let's talk about reads. So in the actual Paxos algorithm itself, which was unbeknownst to me before this because I still need to read the paper and I will be doing so on this channel soon enough, we basically require a quorum of nodes in order to actually perform a read, right? It's not good enough to read from the master. You need to read from a majority of the nodes. That being said, this is a little more expensive than we'd like. For a read, what we can actually just do is read from the master, right? Because the master is effectively the source of truth in something like Paxos. That being said, the master itself is not perfect. There are situations where, you know, if a master goes down, we don't want to be sending it any more read requests. And that's why we have something known as master leases. So a master lease is pretty simple. Basically on some interval, the master is getting approval from its electable replicas to stay as the master for a certain amount of time. So for example, it's gonna reach out to two of its replicas over here if we have basically an electable replica set of size three. Um, and then it's basically gonna say, hey, do I still have the lease? And then one of them at least has to respond saying, sure, you still have the lease for 30 more seconds. Then the master has its own uh, permission and the permission of one of the replicas, again, allowing it to achieve this quorum. And now it has the lease for 30 more seconds. And so basically, as long as this master has the master lease, it is capable of responding to read requests. Now you might be thinking, Jordan, why do we even need a master lease in the first place? Obviously, we just have a master and it should always be able to handle reads. Well, let's imagine a case where basically the master goes down and we have to perform a leader election. So basically, so there could be a case where a master undergoes a network partition. So in a network partition, the master could be unable to communicate with other replicas. However, it could still be running. And so this would be a problem in the following scenario. Let's say we have our master over here, and this is how we're gonna start out with a lease expiring in 30 seconds. And at t equals 15, we have some sort of network partition, right? So now it cannot communicate with the other replicas, okay? Now what's gonna happen is these guys, our two replicas over here, are gonna realize that they haven't heard from the master in a while, and they're gonna start a new election. When this new election is completed, this guy over here, who was previously a replica, becomes the second master. Okay, simple enough. So then let's say that gets done at t equals 17 or something. And so at t equals 20, we have another client over here, client two, and he's going to write to key Jordan equal to hot. Now, because a quorum only requires two nodes in this situation, because there are three total, we can actually go ahead and perform this write successfully with just these two nodes over here. So master two and the other replica. However, if this guy over here at t equals 25, client one, queries the key or queries the value for key Jordan, 
he can actually still reach out to master one because the master uh, lease expired at t equals 30 and it's still only t equals 25. So the master, which is still up and running at this point, but just is network partitioned from the other replicas in the cluster, is then going to respond with Jordan equals ugly and then all of a sudden we no longer have single copy semantics. So how do we actually fix this? Well, it's a pretty simple solution. If we're going to have an election like we had over here, that election process basically needs to wait for the previous master lease to time out. So even though these guys notice that the master is not communicating with them at t equals 15, they have to wait 15 seconds because they know the master's lease will expire at t equals 30, and then they can go ahead and proceed with the election. This will ensure that the master is unable to respond to read requests when there is actually a new master in play. Cool, the last piece of this is going to be DNS, or basically domain name services. How do we actually figure out what replicas are alive, what replicas are existing in our replication group for a particular partition? Well, things can happen all the time. For example, we may want to add more electable replicas, so we can add or remove those, or perhaps one of our electable replicas is changing its IP address or something like that, and we need to make all of our nodes aware of that fact. Well. Basically, it's pretty simple. You can have changes to domain names actually just treated like normal rights within that particular shard. And so it's pretty simple. It just means we're going to have to achieve a quorum on our right. However, the one interesting thing about this piece right here is that when the master propagates a DNS change proposal, right, the master can basically just read some file uh, that some sort of database administrator can update and then it'll basically propagate those DNS changes. The one important piece here is that we need to get a quorum both on the cluster before and after the DNS change. Why? Well, let's explain it. Let's imagine we have this guy as our master node and we've got two replicas because we have a, uh, basically a cluster of size three, meaning that we need a quorum of size two in order to approve a write. So let's say that basically we have replica one at address X, replica two at address Y, and then what we're doing is basically saying, oh, you know what, replica one is going to move to address C. So if we want to take the write move R1 to address C, we can actually get that done by completing it on master and replica one. The problem is when we actually complete this write, replica one is going to be moved over here to address C. So then all of a sudden, if this guy, uh, our master goes down and this uh, write was only on this node, which is no longer part of our cluster, then our cluster just compo is composed of these two nodes neither of which actually has our write. And so all of a sudden we've lost that data. So it's important basically to ensure that this write also goes through on replica two so that we ensure there is a quorum both before and after that configuration change is made. A couple of other quick details about consensus just because of these, uh, these are a couple of the edge cases that they mention. Number one is that if we add a new replica to our election cluster, they aren't allowed to actually vote in elections until they're caught up to the point at which they were added. This ensures that they don't make any erroneous votes. The same idea is going to occur with corrupted replicas, right? It's possible that disks can be corrupted. We have things like checksums to try and detect this. But if a particular replica does have its disk corrupted, we don't want to allow it to make votes anymore. We basically want to say, hey, go get yourself caught up, get the proper data, and then you can start voting again. Finally, uh, initially at least in the paper, uh, the software that they were using for performing Paxos did not actually use epoch numbers. So we discussed this quite a bit in our raft videos, but the gist is every time there's a master election, we provide the master with a new monotonically increasing epoch number. The reason that we do this is so that any delayed packets that go to an old master cannot be propagated as a typical write. It's funny because uh, the original writer of the software figured that this was so unlikely that it didn't even need to be implemented. But Google's philosophy here is basically, if it can happen, we should guard against it. And so they did, uh, they did go ahead and implement that. Cool, let's get to some quick conclusions. Number one is that if you can uh, basically handle the performance hit, it's a lot easier to reason about strong consistency. It just is. Uh, it does mean that you're gonna have to write to one single place per shard. However, that being said, uh, you know, it's just easier to think about from a user perspective. You don't have to worry about like reading your own writes or monotonic reads or anything like that. Uh, it's nice to have one copy semantics. It's not always necessary in the sense that, you know, sometimes you can get away with stale replicas and it's rarely ever gonna affect your user, but you do have to think about those trade-offs. 
Number two is that you don't have to completely implement Paxos as it's mentioned in the paper, right? By using things like master leases, they come up with this cheeky solution in order to actually greatly increase their read throughput without having to do like a fully perfect consensus algorithm. Number three is that within reason, we should design for correctness in all scenarios. This means that you know if we're trying to build single copy semantics, uh, you don't want to basically implement solutions for half of the race conditions and leave the other half be, because you are probably going to hit those. Like I said though, this should be within reason. They explicitly choose to exclude any Byzantine fault tolerance because they figure that the chances of that happening are so unbelievably slim that they really just don't need to worry about it. And it's going to make the system a lot more complex too, which is also a trade-off that you all have to think about. The last piece of this is don't design for unnecessary scale. These guys basically started out without pretty much any partitioning whatsoever, added that in, and then they partitioned multiple tables. And basically the gist here is, you know, build out your initial system, make sure it's correct, start to see how it's being used, and then you can reprioritize tasks as they basically come in and you see what is needed most at one time. So I think that despite this paper being uh, not like a groundbreaking system or anything. It is a really nice lesson in just software engineering in general And it's a good application of how you would actually perform consensus on an existing database because we do see a lot of databases coming around doing this type of thing Spanner, CockroachDB, DB, and it's kind of up in the air or at least it was to me up until this point how they might be implementing that type of thing But I think that this paper ultimately explains it really well. Anyways guys, I hope you enjoy your week I'll be seeing you in the next one. I've got a fantasy football draft tonight, so I got to get uh, off and get prepared for that. But uh, yeah, we'll talk soon.